comes to mind when you think about cannons? <laughs> you may think of military cannons, or ship cannons, or even literary cannons. But today, I want to tell you about salmon cannons. The salmon cannon was invented in the United States to help Pacific salmon move safely up river. The salmon swim into one end of the cannon, like so, fly through a wetted tube, and are projected out the other end of the cannon and deposited in all their fishy glory safely back into the river. <laughs> Flying fish aside, the salmon cannon has a very serious purpose. They're mostly used to help migratory Pacific salmon move over hydroelectric dams that are blocking their migration routes and preventing them from reproducing. Over the last century, as hydroelectric dam construction has increased, Pacific salmon populations have plummeted, sometimes by more than 90%. But although hydroelectric dams have devastated salmon, they haven't been all bad for the Pacific Northwest. They brought cheap, clean, renewable energy to rural areas and stimulated economic development. To this day, the majority of electricity produced in that region comes from hydro. The salmon cannon and the situation in the Pacific Northwest illustrate a trade-off that's being repeated around the world. Hydroelectricity uses rivers to produce renewable energy, but that energy is not necessarily ecosystem-friendly because it threatens rivers and the fish that live in them. This trade-off speaks to a larger question. How do we address the climate crisis while still protecting the natural resources that will help us solve the crisis itself? My answer to that question is it's all about balance. Balance between hydro and rivers, and more generally between energy and ecosystems. There are many examples in the fight against climate change of how we have to make trade-offs and subsequently find balance. But I am a river scientist, so today I'm gonna to use hydroelectricity as an example of how we can try to find balance between energy production and ecosystem conservation. Hydroelectricity, or hydropower as Americans call it, is a really simple concept. Flowing water is directed through turbines which spin and generate electricity. As I said before, hydropower is especially important right now because it's a low carbon emission renewable energy solution. Currently, 75% of global renewable energy production comes from hydro. Accordingly, many countries, including the United Kingdom, promote hydropower as a way to help meet sustainable development goals. In other parts of the world, hydropower can bring life-changing electricity to remote and underdeveloped areas. In places where rainfall is unpredictable, hydropower dams can allow for year-round irrigated agriculture. And in places where it rains too much, those same dams are very useful for flood control, which we already know is important because in Scotland it is always raining. But hydropower has some serious drawbacks. Building a dam in a river is like putting a roadblock in the middle of a highway. It totally messes up the flow of traffic in both directions. Dams not only impact fish, like salmon, but also change water quality, insect populations, riverside plants, and the entire river food web. Losing fish is also a major problem for people that depend on those fish for food and income. And not only that, but the reservoirs created by some dams can flood historic sites and even people's homes, sometimes forcing entire communities to relocate. A dam also changes the structure of a river. Dams slow the flow of water, which means that sand, silt, and gravel in the water hit the dam 
and then drop onto the riverbed. This basically creates a giant underwater sandbox just above the dam. Sandboxes are bad news for fish that need clean, rocky bottoms, and they're also not good for the dam itself, because as a dam fills up with sand, it holds less and less water and then doesn't last as long. Clearly, like any technology, hydropower has trade-offs. To alleviate some of the negative effects of hydropower, scientists and engineers are working together to develop some technological solutions. First of all, we need to make sure that fish can get around the hydropower dam obstacle. The most common way to do this is by using a fish ladder. Now, fish ladders are not what they seem because obviously a fish cannot climb people ladders. <laughs> a fish ladder is a term for a series of stepped pools that allow fish to jump up and then over the dam. And these can be very effective in allowing fish full access to a river. Now, fish ladders can be tricky to design. For example, a salmon or a trout can easily jump over those little steps. But what about eels? Eels can't jump, so they can't use a fish ladder. Eels are better served by what we call a bristle ramp. Bristle ramps allow eels to squiggle their way through a forest of plastic bristles and wiggle over the dam. So when we're designing fish passage structures, we have to take all different types of fish into account. A second thing we can do for rivers is to use designer flows. A designer flow uh, basically means we change the relationship between a dam and a river to benefit something, like fish populations. Most of the time, this means we imitate a natural river and rain system. So, during the rainy season, we release a lot of water. During the dry season, we release a little bit of water. Basically, we're trying to help the dam feel like its normal non-dam self. <laughs> Designer flows are especially being proposed in parts of Asia, such as the Mekong River Basin. The Mekong is a monsoonal system, which means it has long dry spells followed by large floods. Fish in the Mekong are adapted to these floods and rely on floodwaters to reproduce. These fish also feed millions of people each year. But when hydropower dams were built on the Mekong, floodwaters declined, and with them went the fish. Dam. <laughs> Enter the designer flow. Scientists and dam designers are currently working together to develop a flow plan that mimics the Mekong's natural cycle of rainy and dry seasons. Hopefully, once this plan is implemented, fish populations will bounce back feeding the people that depend on them, and the hydropower dams can continue to generate electricity. A third technical solution is to use a sediment bypass. Sediment bypass is a fancy word for a sand tunnel. One of the problems with dams that I mentioned before is they create sandboxes filled with sediment. Sandboxes are bad for fish, and they're bad for dams, and they're also not good for downstream coastal and estuary ecosystems that rely on inputs of sand coming from a river. If all that sand is stuck behind a dam somewhere, it doesn't do anybody any good. So one way to uh, sediment buildup is an especially big problem during floods because floodwaters carry a lot of dirt. If all that dirt-filled water hits a dam, it fills up the sandbox really fast. One way to deal with that problem is to use a sediment bypass. So basically, this is a big tunnel that takes flood water and lets it keep going past the dam. This reduces the sediment buildup, <coughs> makes the fish happier, and provides sand for those downstream coastal ecosystems. Overall, these technologies show that it is possible to balance energy production and protecting ecosystems. But this is a balance that we have to constantly work for. And you and I are the people that need to do that work. Because hydropower is popping up all over the world. And it might even be in your community. 
So there's a couple things you can do. Number one, pay attention to who you vote for. Yes, yes indeed. Look for representatives with a well-informed renewable energy policy and who also support freshwater conservation. Number two, if hydropower happens in your community, advocate for your river. Encourage developers to use these technical solutions that can help make hydro more sustainable. And number three, support local conservation groups, like the River Trust. These people are already monitoring your rivers, and they can help make sure they stay safe. Hydropower will always have trade-offs, but it's also not going away. Currently, two-thirds of the world's major rivers are already dammed, and that number is increasing every day. But by using science to develop innovative technologies, it is possible to balance hydropower and river conservation. And if we can do that, then we can also balance the other trade-offs we have to make in the fight against climate change. And this can be successful. For example, over the last 20 years, in certain rivers in the Pacific Northwest, salmon have started to recover. The introduction of fish ladders and sediment bypasses, and yes, even salmon cannons, have allowed the fish to return to their ancestral spawning grounds for the first time in over a century. There's still a lot of work to be done before Pacific salmon are fully recovered. But for now, in the Pacific Northwest and around the world, there is hope. Thank you. <laughs>